Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer Macellas and I'm a research geologist with the U.S. Geological Survey. Thanks for tuning into my presentation today. Before we dive in, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors Noreen Buster, Emily Way, and Dan Charletta. Together, we've been working in several very different barrier island environments along the east coast of the United States to assess shoreface sediment availability and on natural and developed coasts. Much of shoreface research to date has focused on its morphology and cross shore extent. This is important because shoreline position and the shoreface are actually intimately linked. So subtle changes in shoreface morphology and extent can result in big changes at the shoreline. In general, the shoreface is defined as a zone from the shoreline to some distance offshore where wave driven sediment transport ceases. Because this definition is dependent on wave climate, there are cross shore extent changes with time as shown here in the upper panel from Kinsella et al. 2020. The cross shore extent is often referred to as depth of closure, or what we'll call the morphologic shore face toe, and is a commonly used metric in coastal engineering, originally described by Hallemeyer in 1978. More recently, Ortiz and Ashton, 2016, used linear area wave theory to define a morphodynamic depth of closure for a given time scale of interest based on the time scale of wave diffusivity. You can see an example of the 100 year and the 1000 year estimates for Fire Island, New York, in the bottom right panel. To me, this was significant because it extended our ability to define shoreface extent to centennial and longer timescales. And this is important because over longer timescales, sea level rise becomes a factor. And in order to predict how sea level rise will change shoreline position, we need to know the shape and extent of the shoreface. So in addition to these wave mediated changes in shoreface extent that we just talked about on the last slide, there's evidence to suggest that sea level rise itself may change the cross shore extent of the shoreface. In the series of plots from Cowell and Kinsella 2018, we see that the extent of the active shore face, as indicated by the height of the green boxes, is reduced with increasing sea level as you move from panels A to D. This also means that the lower part of the shore face, which already responds more slowly than the upper shore face, will make up more and more of the profile as sea level, rates in, sea level rise rates increase, possibly leading to a reduction in sediment delivered to the shore face. And the author suggests that these lags between the upper and lower shore face are particularly important over decades and centuries. These changes in cross shore face cross shore extent and sea level rise mediated lags in shore face response are critical for predicting the future behavior of barrier islands. This was demonstrated very nicely by Lorenzo Trey Ashton in 2014, who used morphodynamic modeling to predict barrier island response to sea level rise and demonstrated that the predicted responses were very sensitive to, to fluxes of sediment from the shore face. And this makes sense because barriers require landward fluxes of sediment, such as from overwash, to maintain heights and widths that will allow them to migrate landward as sea level rises. You can see an example of landward directed flux in the picture at the top of the slide. It's thought that sediment removed from the upper shore face via, via overwash will drive onshore transport of sediment from the lower shore face until the shore face slope returns to equilibrium. And this is exactly how the shore face fluxes are parameterized in the model, as you can see from the schematic of the Lorenzo Treban Ashton model framework at the bottom of the slide. Here, shore face flux is calculated as a deviation from equilibrium slope multiplied by a shore face response rate. And in some follow-up work, the same author suggested that this coupling of beach and shore face response through cross shore and along shore transport is particularly important over decadal and centennial timescales. So in total, many of these models suggest that sea level rise will impact not only the morphologic response of the shore face itself, but also the fluxes to and from the shore face that drive barrier island evolution over time scales that are really important to people, those, deca those decades to centennial time scales. And so what are the uncertainties associated with these estimates and is there a way that we can help reduce them? So one broadly recognized uncertainty is geology. Changes in shore face geology might completely alter the morphologic response of the shore face. And here I'd like you to think about bedrock exposed at the seafloor that will inhibit profile adjustment. The morphodynamic shore face toe or depth of closure might be in 30 meters of water, but if the seafloor from 20 to 30 meters is composed of bedrock, the shore face, the lower shore face response rate is going to be zero. And it changes and changes in sediment composition, either at the seafloor or below it, might reduce the flux of sediment to the shore face as barrier islands migrate landward. The schematic on the right of the lower panel of the schematic on the right depicts just such a scenario where mobile shore face sediment availability is limited by less mobile sediment in the subsurface. Another uncertainty is us, humans. Human interventions in coastal systems such as beach nourishment, hard structures, or artificially tall dunes could alter shore face behavior and associated fluxes. 
we are agents of coastal sediment flux and we need parameters that can account for that. So we suggest that one way to reduce these uncertainties is to leverage geologic signatures preserved in the shore face to help refine estimates of shore face extent and sediment availability. Using observations of shore face geology, we can assess cross shore and subsurface limitations in shore face sediment availability, providing a snapshot of the results of both natural and human sediment fluxes in the system. The trick, though, is to actually measure it. So shore face and the shore, shore face and surf zone are notoriously unfriendly to the acoustic geophysical tools we would normally use to assess shore face geomorphology. And the instruments are heavy, so using them on small vessels that are capable of getting into shallow water is really not as straightforward as it might seem. So we had to get creative. And like many people before us, we mounted single beam echo sounders on personal watercraft or jet skis to measure shore face morphology from as close to the shoreline as possible to two to four kilometers offshore. And generally, and we were around 50 meters from the mean high, mean high water shoreline, which is pretty great. In some cases, we added multi-beam bathymetry and water depths of greater than three or four meters to just increase the data re resolution offshore. The subsea floor geophysics was definitely the biggest challenge. In one location, we were able to collaborate with the US Army Corps of Engineers to utilize an amphibious vessel, and that's depicted on the right hand side, the top of the right hand side of the screen. Uh, here you see that the vessel is with the chirp system, and the chirp system is here hanging over the side. In other places, we didn't have access to that vessel. So we put the system on a sled with balloon wheels and we launched it from the beach. And this operation is no joke. It takes about eight people and uh, there's three people on the boat, the vessel offshore that tows the sled back and forth across the, the surf zone and the shore face. And then there's five people on the beach that help to launch both the personal watercraft and launch and recover the sled. It is really no easy feat to get these data and I am, super grateful for the fantastic crew at the our operations group here at the St. Pete Center that said yes we'll figure it out before they said no and then we're rock stars on the beach uh, and in the surf zone and actually acquiring the data. So you might be asking where we did all of this so we're getting there. So uh, this is what you're looking at here is a map of the east coast of the United States and I've put locations of New York City and Washington DC to try to help orient everyone. If you've had an opportunity to visit, you might have visited one of those two places. We have three barrier island field sites distributed along this section of coast, and all with varying levels of barrier behavior and human intervention. The first site is Rockaway Peninsula in New York, which is the developed end member and has been fixed in place with seawalls and groins and is regularly nourished. The second site is Fire Island, New York, which is sparsely populated and regularly nourished but has few coastal engineering structures to impede natural sediment exchanges. The last site is the undeveloped end member, which is Cedar Island, Virginia. And this, this island has migrated landward approximately 15 to 30 meters per year since 1984 without any human alterations. So given the differences between these three sites, we thought they would be ideal for exploring shore face morphology and geology and the implications of variations in both of those things on future barrier behavior. So we'll start off with Rockaway Peninsula, which is located just south of the metropolis of New York City. So when I say that it's a developed M member, I am not kidding. This work is being led by Emily Way, who shared both her bathymetry and her uh, seismic interpretations. What we see from the bathymetric data is a very steep upper shore face and a much less steep lower shore face. But in order to look at how far sediment extends across this profile, we'll need to look at the geophysical data. And since some of you may not be able to be, may not be familiar with seismic data, let's step through. So the first dark black line that you see on the profile is the seafloor, which means everything above that is the water column. And this feature at the bottom that looks very kind of similar to the seafloor is actually what's called a multiple, and this is a common artifact in seismic data. You'll also see that there's a that we find we see a borrow pit, just as we do in the in the bathymetric profile above it. And so basically everything that's in between the dark blue line and the, and the light blue line on this profile is interpretable geology. And if you look to the landward edge of the profile, I'm gonna guide you with my mouse here, you'll see a flat line reflection surface at the, at, in the profile. And this is what we interpret as the base of the shore face. And this, this layer essentially, geologic feature, essentially separates the mobile sediment of the shore face from the less mobile sediment beneath it. 
And where that base of shore face reflection surface intersects the seafloor is what we interpret as the geologic shore face toe. And so you can see from the profile that the sediment does not extend across the whole shore face. And if we map the geologic toe back to the bathymetric profile, we see that it's quite close to the, the shore and coincides with the change in shore face slope. So moving a little bit further to the east in a very similar wave climate, we'll, hit, we'll talk about Fire Island now. Despite that very similar wave climate to Rockaway, we see that the profile looks completely different. Here, the entire shore face is steep, and there is an obvious sandbar in the surf zone, as depicted here. So looking to the geophysical data, we see that the sediment is distributed much further across the profile than in Rockaway. And this moves the geologic shore face toe more than a kilometer offshore and to a water depth of about 14 and a half meters. Moving further south to Cedar Island, we see that the Cedar Island shore face is the most gradual of the three. And like Rockaway, no sandbar was measured. However, the geophysical data reveal that the shore face extends almost a kilometer offshore. But since the shore face is so gradual, this corresponds to a depth of only six meters, the shallowest of the three geologic toes that we've observed. We've really only begun to scratch the surface of the, of the data at these three locations. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, we focused on only one location along each barrier island. And as you might imagine, there's an incredible amount of longshore variability in these systems. So we're excited to continue to explore how that variability influences the influences shore face sediment availability and extent. That said, I think what we found so far is really compelling. We believe that this geologic shore face toe actually represents all of the forcings that are at play on the shore face. So a combination of sediment supply, wave climate, rate of sea level rise, and human intervention. What we're thinking that we might be able to do, although it might be challenging, is to determine of these different influences, what are the primary controls at any given shore face? So we're excited to explore that further. Uh, in, in a comparative sense, shore face extent as defined by sediment cover, um, the greatest shore face extent we found at Fire Island and the narrowest, the, the, the narrowest we found is at Rockaway. And this is particularly interesting since both have very similar wave climates and grain sizes. So there's obviously something going on that's controlling the very different nature of those shore faces. Uh, at Cedar Island, which is our natural end member, and Rockaway, which is our heavily developed end member, both shore faces are almost entirely devoid of sediment. And so despite the many differences at these sites, this lack of sediment actually makes them both more reliant on updrift sources of sediment. As sea level rises and landward and, flu and sediment fluxes are directed landward to help the barrier island keep up with sea level rise, those fluxes won't be replenished from the shore face, shore face at Cedar and Rockaway. So this actually makes these locations much more vulnerable to sea level rise. All right, that's uh, all we have today. Thanks again for virtually attending this presentation. My email address is here at the bottom of the slide if you want to nerd out on all things Shoreface. Thanks so much.